Hi, welcome to this video. We're going to talk about the previews of Calculus. This is the book Calculus Early Transcendentals 8th edition. So let's go for it. Then, first situation that we're going to approach into this one is about the area problem. As a matter of fact, the origins of Calculus go back at least 2,500 years to the ancient Greeks. At that point, maybe uh, it was like kind of difficult to find the area of certain uh, figure. So for this reason, they started working with the areas uh, using the method of exhaustion. Basically, this is like kind of approximation. It's like how you can find an area of A, any polygon by dividing it into triangles. So you have like this polygon, so you can split that um between the uh, the triangles and at the end of the day we know that the base times height over 2 gives us the area of the triangle so you can split that polygon into different areas and you end up with the solution of the total area so the problem is then when you're facing kind of a circle figures so the idea is like the, the the Greeks they try to cir circumscribe polygons to estimate it. So if we ha you have this circle, you know that the sides is like the under under uh, score. This one should be three, four, five, so on and so forth. The number of sides. The more sides you get, the more approximation of the area you get it. So at the end of the day, if the a n we can consider it as the area of inscribed polygon with n sides then as n increases, increases then a n becomes closer to the area of a circle it's kind of approximation so we start talking about the limit so we can understand that when n tends to infinite uh, under the circumstances of the area when where n is the number of sides then you will have an approximation of the total area. So the, the only point like this notation of the limits, maybe it was not introduced by Greeks, but that's the final idea of the approximation of the method of exhaustion uh, with the area. So then it was like kind of indirect reasoning. Uh, then Eudoxus in the fifth century before Christ did something similar, for example, to get the approximation, the approximation for the circle, the areas of uh, of a circle, which is p times r square. Then, um, the, these uh, to find areas of regions, we can find areas by rectangles. So imagine that we have a function. This is the y axis. This is the x axis, and this is a function that it represents y equal x squared, which increases like really fast so we want to know what's the area under the curve in the point 1.1 so this should be area a maybe you don't know the tools so you can get some approximation modeling with rectangles as you can see the first one is when you're splitting that between one fourth one half and so on and so forth and the other two graphs you're getting more and more division of those rect rectangles then when you're getting a lot of a lot of rectangles uh, with this area you'll get a better approximation of the area so then this, this is one of the problems of the calculus the area problem is one of the central problem and then in this branch is going to be condensed by the integral calculus then the other part we have the tangent problem so we need to know what could be the, um, the the slope of a tangent line in a specific point of a curve imagine again that we have a function y equal f of x and then we want to know at the given point of p as a tangent line we can um maybe um kind of describe or the meaning of that could be as a line that it only touches a curve in one specific point then we're going to have here just like in this p so this t curve is what we call the tangent line it's just like 
touching in this specific point of P of Y equal F of X. So the question here, I want to know this slope at this specific point. So then um, the idea is like we need to know two points. We know that the slope function or the slope formula is given by y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. But you don't have that values, you just have one point. So maybe it could be uh, maybe a nearby p point to estimate a pair of points and then you can at the end of the day get the slope of this curve. So then we have again the curve, imagine that is this one, the red curve is the, the part that we're, we're having here, which is P. So we can say that P is the basically the representation of a number A, so the exact point into the um, kind of, um, kind of the, the graph that we have here, which is the, which is kind of the, the, the position A is A, on the coordinates f of x. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here we have like the Cartesian plane, we have this one, right? Then imagine that you have like another, another, another curve that it cuts the, um, the q part is like kind of second. So we have here the x and then we have here the f of x, right? So we have this another pair of points. If we want to get the slope of this specific blue one, we're going to have here into the denominator x minus a, which is the change into the x-axis. And in the vertical side, we have the difference, y2 minus y1 could be f of x minus f of a. So then the slope of the blue curve is given by f of x minus f of a over x minus a. Imagine that q is getting closer and closer to P. So then we're saying that the slope is given by the limit when Q tends to be P of MPQ. Then you can represent that, the limit X uh, to A, F of X minus F of A over X minus A. This is another branch of the calculus, which is the differential calculus. Um, we have this actually was developed 2000 after to the this one that we have of the area problem and actually it was French mathematician Pierre Fermat it was like an English mathematician John Wallis, Isaac Barrow and Isaac Newton and then a German mathematician Gottfried Leibniz. Okay great so the third part of the calculus velocity Imagine that you have a table where in the first row you have like the time the time elapsed uh, given by seconds, zero seconds, one second, two seconds, so on and so forth. And we have the distance in feet. We have 0, 2, 9, 24, 40, 42, 71. As you know, the rate of the increase is kind of different. It's not constant, right? So it could be kind of acceleration into that. So imagine that we want to know the average velocity between the second two and the second four. So given this formula that the average velocity is given by the change in position over time elapsed, you know that the change in position is 42 minus nine. So it's gonna be four, this one and nine, minus four minus two. So then you have as, a, as an answer that the, the, the velocity of this one is exactly or is like a specific 16.5 feet uh, per second. Imagine that you get like a smaller interval. So we're getting from two to three seconds. So again, the change in position could be 24 minus nine over three minus two. So you will end up with 15 feet uh, per second. Then to calculate t, t velocity uh, should be kind of, diff, kind of the same. So imagine that we get a closer, we get a closer interval, a smaller interval from two to two five. If we want to get then from two to two five, we have 15.8 minus nine over 2.5 minus two. Then you will end up with 13.6. And now you're getting the uh, kind of the interval between 2.3 and between uh, 
2.21, right? So then here, uh, you will get here at the end of the day that the uh, change of the interval should be something related, kind of similar to the tangent issue, right? So here is the average when you're getting, it's getting closer to 10. So then we represent that could be like this is the graph of velocity. This is the second curve, which is the blue curve. And then at the end of the day, the, 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 just the specific slope in this point could be Ft minus F2 over T minus 2. Then could be at the end of the day, the limit when the time tends to two, what is the velocity of this specific uh, part. So then the other situation of calculus is the limit of a sequence. It comes from the Zeno's paradox. So imagine that kills uh, this person starts at a point A1 and the tortoise starts at a point T1. When Achilles reach A2 equal to T1, then tortoise is ahead at position T2. The process continues indefinitely. Tortoise uh, is always ahead. The successive positions of Achilles A1, A2, A3, and the successive position of tortoise T1, T2, T3. Okay, then we can consider that like as a sequence, a sequence AN is a set of numbers written in a definite order. So for example, this could be a sequence, one, one over two, one over three, etc. And then we can represent as the AN equal one N. If we can represent in that, in that uh, specific um, um, graph, we know that when we are getting more A, we're getting exactly equal to zero or we represent that in the Cartesian uh, plane, we will have here that in the meantime, n is going up at the end of the day, the result is really close to zero. So that the limit of n when it tends to infinite, one over n is equal to zero. And then here we have for the problem of the Achilles and the tortoise, then uh, the limit when n goes to infinite, a n is equal to p, and the limit t n n goes to p. So then when the point is p, the Achilles will reach the tortoise. Then the sum of a series, we have this order kind of paradox of Aristotle. A man standing in a room cannot walk to the wall. Um, in order to do so, he would first have to go fast, go half the distance, then have the remaining distance and then again half of what still remains, this process can always be continued and it can never be ended. So you have one guy each time that this guy walks, like walks uh, half of the previous one. So each time is with like uh, making progress uh, lower and lower. So then we can represent that one is exactly equal to one, two plus one, four plus, etc. I mean, of one over two n. So then the problem is like maybe Zeno argued that it didn't, didn't make sense to add indefinitely. However, we know already that maybe if we have, for example, the decimal, decimal notation 0 0.3 periodic, then you can represent in that way like this, right? So then it's never getting to 0 0.3 exactly, but it tends to be. So then at the other day, it tends to be 1 over 3. If you want to sum just like the first sequence, we have one over two, then the two, we have one over two plus one over four, and so on and so forth. So then we can notice how you can sum this uh, sequence and you will end with a number really close to, really close to one. Okay. I hope it has worth. Thank you so much. If you see maybe something to improve or something to change, just like let me know. Thank you so much. See you next time. Bye-bye.